Very good. Uh, so for today's popcorn theory seminar, we're very happy to have Edward all the way from here, and he'll be telling us about deriving the simplest gauge string duality. Thanks very much. Um, so today I'm going to try to basically sum up some of the work I've been doing uh, in collaboration with Rajesh uh, Gopakumar, basically over the last two years uh, here. Um, it's morphed into a somewhat bigger project. So, uh, you know, this, this talk is basically trying to sum up uh, three papers, one that came out in December, the B model that should hopefully come out next month. Um, and, you know, out of all of that in one talk, I'll try to basically take one snippet in particular and try to convince you of something um, that we can try to think about really the stupidest possible gauge theory. And of that, even the sort of silliest one, which is just going to be an integral, a zero plus zero dimensional integral uh, over random matrices just with the Gaussian potential. So in a way, this is just n squared IID random variables, okay? And show you that moments in that, uh, moments of that theory can actually be recast as some stringy correlators. And sort of the main physical tool that will be interesting is this idea of open, closed, open triality. And I'll say a little uh, what that is. And this is something that's going to be more general and I, we think sort of somewhat deep for holography, um, but we'll use it also just as a way of verifying our proposal. So let me first try to uh, just kind of orient ourselves a little, um, kind of what, what the spirit of the talk is for and what we're trying to aim to do. So, you know, we hear a lot of talks about holography um, and maybe one fruitful way of thinking about holography is in terms of this pyramid, that there's sort of kind of three pieces to think about. And a lot of the talks we hear about holography often sort of, especially in the last 10 years, have maybe focused on kind of this lower part here. Um, so this box over here is what you would think about as the CFT and ADS CFT. This is the sort of ADS part. And it's basically going between some description, which is non-gravitational uh, and some sort of, uh, effective description of the bulk, okay? It's some low energy target space description, uh, say like general relativity plus some QFT fields on it. Um, the reason I say open string description here is that because this is a theory of matrices and really these matrices, the IJ indices of the matrices are really the chan Paton factor. They're, they're labeling which deep brain sort of open strings can end on. So often I'll sort of talk about open closed duality and it's gonna, the open refers to basically the gauge theory side. The focus I want to take today is more actually that of the world sheet. So it's going to be going between sort of this matrix description and a description of sort of 2D surfaces with some certain marked points. Those marked points are where you would insert vertex operators on your world sheets to compute some sort of observables. Okay. Um, and I should say that, you know, before ADS CFT, this is uh, actually a diagram taken from the original uh, paper by Tuft in which the Tuft expansion was proposed. Okay. This is from 1973. There was already idea about how the kind of large end gauge theories were sort of secretly string theories. And there was sort of this picture uh, that at least makes it plausible that somehow the Feynman diagrams should be thought of as some sort of skeleton of, 2D, of a 2D surface, which is the world sheet of the string dual, okay? So the, the real question we're gonna try to address today is can we sort of make this intuition precise, okay? So can we try to, Really, what we want to do is just start from the gauge theory, and this is just basically we're going to be thinking about Feynman diagrams. Okay, so uh, what we want to do is we want to translate between sort of large end width contractions and the combinatorics that of, thereof into sums of two D surfaces. Okay, and so to understand large end width contractions, we we're going to study really the simplest possible example. So this is again a zero plus zero dimensional theory, just an integral over a matrix. Um, What's going to basically play the role of the CFT is, is what's down here. Okay, what specifies the theory is this choice of the potential, and the observables you want to look at are going to be traces of m to the ki for some ki's, and endpoint functions are just products of these traces. Okay, so that's going to be sort of the name of the game, and we're going to try to understand in what sense are these kind of stringy correlation functions. Okay, so. Uh, let me make a, one slide here to say a couple things. You know, matrix models and strings are a very old subject. We have a lot of the pioneers of it here. Uh, thanks, David, for coming. Um, let me try to just distinguish a little uh, kind of what this work is trying to do that's a little different from what we've already done 30 years, over the past 30 years. And the main thing I'd, I'd sort of suggest the sort of highlight is that we're going to try to step away from what's called the double scaling limit. Okay, so what is this double scaling limit if you're not familiar with it? It was basically the proposal as to how the Feynman diagrams reconstruct this 2D surface, okay? The idea 
So what, what I'm showing over here, okay, some snippet of some very large Feynman diagram. We're going to zoom in. So these are the vertices. Uh, the double lines are the, the ribbons um, of some gauge theory Feynman diagram. It has two lines because it's a matrix theory. Okay. So we look at this Feynman diagram, and then we look at the dual graph. So note that here, there's some, for example, a cubic interaction. So the dual graph is a bunch of triangles. And we think of this as a triangulation of the world sheet. Okay. The idea is that you then need to take a sort of limit as you take the size of these triangles to be very small, some sort of continuum limit. And on the matrix model side, that corresponds to what's called the double scaling limit. Okay. These are so, planar graphs, aren't they? Uh, they could be planar, they could be any genus, really. Oh. Um, yeah. So there, there's a, the particular power of N of the graph tells me about the genus of the graph. Yeah. Um, but we want to sort of step away here today and propose a different way of about thinking about how the Feynman diagrams realize the world sheet. Okay. So one reason you might think that this can't be the end of the story is that in ADSCFT, for example, we don't do any double scaling. Okay. So somehow the Feynman diagrams of say n equals four are having to reconstruct the world sheets without taking that sort of continuum limit. So the idea is we want to step away from that. We're going to just look at the classical, well, the sort of standard tooth limit of ADS-CFT and not this double scale limit. Okay, and of course, we're also not the first people to step away from that limit. So, I mean, I would, uh, as far as I know, probably some of the first people to think about some of uh, kind of the string interpretation of non-double scaled uh, matrix integrals was in the work of Digraph and Vafa. And these matrix integrals are essentially, uh, they descend all the way down from some sort of open string field theory on brains, okay? So this is a perspective I'm happy to chat about, but I won't really talk about so much today. The matrix integrals we talk about can also be viewed in that way. Um, but uh, what we wanna really get at today is to try to understand again, sort of from the point of view of the world sheet, okay? So not some sort of second quantized view. And again, here what's sort of missing is what is the closed world sheet theory? And in particular, can you compute some correlators in these theory and match it to some correlators in the string theory? So there was nothing like that done before. Okay, so that, that's at least what we're trying to aim. That's hopefully a little new. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, before, before I lose people in the talk, let me try to kind of um, summarize some of the things we've learned around three questions, okay? so. The first thing is, well, if it's not a lattice discretization of the surface, how are you going to translate between these large end diagrams and the string world sheet? Okay. So the first answer we're going to do is that the tool we're going to use is what's called the Strabel parametrization of the moduli space of Riemann surfaces of genus G and N punctures. These are just some other N numbers. Okay. And this was famously used in the proof of Witten's conjecture by Konzenich. So this is where we're sort of getting that machinery. Um, one of the things, so, so let me tell you just, you know, in a very bird's eye view, kind of the way that this works, uh, is that if you want to, we're going to map each uh, individual graph onto a point on the moduli space, okay, so in particular some, some world sheet, okay, some 2D surface, the genus of the graph is the same as the genus of the world sheet, and the number of faces is the same as the number of vertex operators here, okay? And essentially the coordinates uh, on this moduli space are very nice in this picture because they're actually just N numbers that we, uh, sorry, well, not N numbers. Uh, we, we basically give to each edge, we assign a real number, positive number called the length, okay? And the lengths of these edges are coordinates over here. Okay? So that's gonna be important later, keep in mind. So later what we're gonna see is that we're gonna always have integer lengths and so that's going to tell us that we're going to be looking at very particular discrete points on the moduli space. Okay, that's just going ahead. One of the other things to take away from this is that we really want to take the slogan that essentially each Feynman diagram itself is some sort of string world sheet. Not just that the sum of Feynman diagrams is equal to the sum over the world sheets, but really sort of at an integrand level matching. Okay. And again, that's going to work by basically using this scribble construction. What do, you, what, do you, um, what do you mean by lengths of the edges? Good. So uh, in higher dimensions, this would basically be the, the Schwinger time of the propagator. So to each edge, there's a propagator. And I can write that propagator in Schwinger time. And sort of the Schwinger time would be the length. Uh, in this case, all of the edges are just going to be set to equal to one. So there's no time in the zero plus zero dimensional example. 
Okay, good. So the second thing is, okay, you talk about deriving some sort of open closed duality. What does that even mean? And of course, I'm going to give you uh, an answer. Well, I'll give you a standard of a derivation that I can live up to. Um, so maybe one way of saying it is that I'm going to rewrite all the observable of traces, all the correlators of traces, as some sum over 2D surfaces, as an integral over this moduli space. In particular, we're going to again look at the integrand itself. And I'm going to tell you that whenever you, you stick in a trace m to the k in your correlator in the, under the, the matrix integral, that's the same as sticking in some cohomology class OK here on the moduli space. Okay. Um, now, in physics, when we think about summing over configuration, summing over these 2D surfaces, we also think about the weight of each configuration is coming from something. It's e to the s, some action. Okay. So once you've done this, you can ask, is there some sort of world sheet theory, some Lagrangian I could write down that gives proper, gives, gives this integrand on moduli space? And we're also going to answer that positively. And in fact, we're going to give you two of them. Okay, so for two matrix models, we're going to give you two different string descriptions. This might be a little confusing if you're thinking about ADS-CFT, you're like, well, there's n equals four, and then there's 2b on ADS-5 cross S5, why are there now two string theories? This is a peculiarity of the fact that the type of string theories we're looking at are so-called topological strings. We start from the sort of stupidest gauge theory, we get the stupidest uh, string theories out of them. And there's a very special symmetry about these uh, topological strings called mirror symmetry. And that relates these two descriptions. So if you want, this is really just the same description of the closed string physics, but in different language. Um, but this is again, the closed string picture, okay? So in one of them, we're gonna basically uh, the thing that sort of determines, so one thing is called the B model, and what determines the physics of the B model uh, here is going to be uh, something called the superpotential. So you tell me the superpotential, I tell you what this B model string is doing, and I'll tell you also how to derive this potential from matrix model quantities. Okay? And then on the A model side, this is going to be uh, a very special type of WZW model, okay? where the, the target is this SL2R mod U1. And the level of the WZW is at a special level K equals one. And this is a super symmetric coset theory. And it's also topologically twisted. And we'll see that we'll need to give a certain vacuum expectation value for some operators. And that's what I mean by this momentum constant. Okay, so the, the main thing is how do we replace the lattice? We use this stable parameterization. What we wanna do is we wanna translate the traces into integrals over the moduli space. And then we wanna think about these integrals over moduli space coming from some sort of generic world sheet theory is nothing that's very uh, sort of crazy, okay? Edward, so yeah. two, two quick questions. Please. One, but, but momentum condensate, you mean like it's literally an homogeneous solution? Yes, that sort of yes. Thing. And second question, why does the A model, model side not depend on the matrix model? Oh, it, it, it does, it does. So depending on which matrix model you have, you'll need to turn on some different condensative operators. You'll need to give events to different operators. So you, see, well, so you turn on some backgrounds. It's just the inhomogeneity yes. that, that depends on the, yes. the exactly. 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 Okay, good. So um, let me tell you then, so, so let's try to get a little through the talk. Um, so what I'm first gonna do is after these kind of large words is just to give you something very concrete to bite your teeth into, okay? So the proposal of an equality of these two correlators, one on the matrix side, one on the string side. Then what we're gonna do is we're going to verify this proposal, okay? And that's actually something that we can do rather quickly. Um, and we'll be using sort of in disguise this tool of open, closed, open triality. And we'll first sort of look at it in a very down to earth way, which is just gonna be the equivalence of two matrix integrals. Okay, so this is a very well-defined thing. And then we'll sort of step away and think a bit about what the steps that we were doing here. So there's maybe two technical messy slides that we'll have here. So we'll just bear with me there. Uh, and then we'll step back and we'll sort of think pictorially a little, what were the manipulations we were doing and what do they mean? And we'll I sort of argue that these are kind of broader lessons to learn about holography. Now, once we've verified the proposal, this, uh, you know, we've, we, we give you this proposal, we check it. Uh, it's maybe still not sort of satisfying, you know, in what sense is that a derivation? And you kind of want to ask, well, why was it that these are the type of string theories that appear? You know, that's sort of what we want to understand in physics is kind of asking, answering the why. And of course there's various levels of that, um, but I'll try to organize those answers for both the A and the B model around three themes. So in this derivation, we'll first try to see um, why the Gaussian 
correlators um, are actually counting particular discrete points on the moduli space. Then we'll see what type of maps from the world sheet to the target space um, sort of localize onto those points. That will be special maps called belly maps. And we'll see how the combinatorics of traces actually encode those maps. And then we'll take a simplifying limit, essentially what's like the BMN limit in ADS CFT. So I look at traces of a large number of operators. And we'll see a nice simplification and connect to sort of the old results that we know from the double scale matrix models. And then we'll repeat the same story on this B model side. So here the language that we're going to be using is that of topological recursion. Then we'll need to basically identify what the B model theory is from the superpotential. And I'll tell you how to sort of translate between matrix model quantities and the superpotential. And then again, we'll take this BMN limit and sort of have this B model perspective on how things simplify. Okay. Maybe it's just wait. Please, please, please. Just say, but what, what is the what is the like momentum quantum number in the BMN? So, so the, the BMN limit here, yeah, this is going to be a trace m to the k for k very large. But, but it does m, but like m doesn't carry a conserved quantum. Number. Ah, so so for example, in the A model, this is going to be the amount of spectral flow. I see, I see. You say there's one of the two chiral U1s is still conserved. I mean, sorry. Uh, is, is there a conserved U1? Not, not totally. So, so we'll see it's like a cigar geometry. So that U1 is... The, the winding U1 is violated. Yes. But the, the translation... That, that one is still there, yes. And that's the one you're using for the, the large momentum in the BMN limit? Yes. Okay, I see. Yes. Okay, so let's start with the proposal. Again, just trying to assert how these correlators and thinking of them as some stringing endpoint functions. So here's the claim <clears throat> that we'll verify later. Okay, so this is an all genus statement. Okay, so this is true to all orders in N. This is not just a leading in N, what large N piece. Okay, this is true to all orders in one over N. Is that if I look at the endpoint function of these traces here, okay, that is the same as computing. Uh, some particular endpoint function on genus G world sheets in this B model string. So it's a topological Landau Ginsburg theory, which is twisted. And here I've specified the potential of the matrix model. It's just a harmonic oscillator potential. And that ends up translating to this super potential for the B model. Okay. And again, over here, there's going to be the same type of mapping that every time there's a trace M to the K, we have this vertex operator that we insert in this uh, A-model description. Um, so I should say I haven't really done many computations here so far. Uh, the things that we've computed are on this side, and hopefully, yeah, that's the third paper, so that's the furthest away. Uh, so what, 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 what corresponds to the choice of level one in the SL2R? In, in the uh, so, so it's always at level one. It's always, a, okay, so, you, so that can't be changed. That can be changed okay. so far. Um, and I should say that these things that I'm saying, I'm simplifying by looking at the Gaussian matrix model where we can compute things <laughs> very easily. Um, and, but I should say that sort of the, the, the general logic behind this is not true only at the free point. So we can also incorporate interactions and that corresponds to turning on a different background here and to deforming the super potential here. So there's again a map of uh, generating a general interacting matrix model, what to do on this side and what to do on that side. So let me now tell you a little about the underlying logic of all of this and how we're going to do that proof. Okay. So the thing that we've been looking at um, is again this open string description, which is some large n matrix model. So we'll focus on the Gaussian for the top, but again, it's not only true just for the free theory. And actually, instead of first going to in, instead of directly deriving these closed strings, we're going to do something a little strange, which is to first go to a different open string description. So Maybe uh, other words for that is just looking at a different matrix model. Okay. And it turns out that this matrix model is actually something that we understand well in terms of string theory. Um, this is an old result from the 90s um, and that basically this matrix model here was understood to be a generating function for uh, correlators in another, yet another string theory, which is down here. Okay. So this guy, you want to, we would basically think about it as a crutch um, for most intensive purposes. Um, it's going to allow us to essentially derive these guys over here. But what we're doing is we start from here, we go to this other open string description, 
This guy, we know what it, uh, what it describes. Basically, it was shown via some integrability reasons that it uh, encodes the correlation functions of this string theory. This string theory is integral, and people started asking, well, why is it solvable? You know, why is it that we got so lucky? And is there maybe some sort of underlying secret topological string hiding in there, which would explain why it's solvable? And indeed, that was answered positively. So this work by Muki and Waffa rewrote this theory here in terms of this uh, A model string. And these people here, uh, Goshal Waffa and then Hanani Oz and Plessler, rewrote it in terms of this B model string over here. Okay. So what we're going to do, we go here, we go down, we go down, and then we use the results from these people to basically establish that equality. But it's not maybe uh, sort of the most satisfying yet as to sort of why that's the theory. And, you know, it doesn't tell us much about making Truth's vision uh, precise. And that's when we focus on what's in the green over here. We want to basically, once we've established the equality of correlators, we want to go directly from here to here and see why is it that you sort of had to land on that theory and do the same over here. And again, the, the main idea is that we're going to basically uh, do this sort of topological recursion uh, that's like a classic tool in matrix models um, and understand that it's sort of secretly a B model string in disguise. Okay. And then over here, what we're going to do is we're going to use that Strable parametrization we talked about to directly map each Feynman diagram onto a point on the moduli space and then understand that this theory here, mostly due to work by Andrea, um, actually localizes to those particular points, okay? And so that will sort of give us an explanation for this over here. Um, you know, I mean, so, it, you know, it's, it's not a total derivation, but at least I think it's sort of making more and more plausible why these are the two theories that have to appear. Okay, so let's move on to just first verifying that equality of correlators. And again, these will be sort of two slightly messy slides, a little technical, but um, uh, you don't need to understand all the details, but, uh, I just want to first just establish that equality, okay? And because it can be done in two slides, it's sort of nice. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is going to be using this sort of general concept of open, closed, open uh, triality as a verification of that proposal. And we're going to look at it in this instance as just what you see here in this box, okay? And it's just the equality of these first and second lines. That's for all intents and purposes, for now, that's all you need to know about open, closed, open triality. So let's look at what these things are. These are an integral over two matrices, K and M. These are N by N matrices, whereas down here it's two matrices A and B, but these are Q by Q matrices, okay? This N by N matrix has some potential and note it has a source Y. This source Y shows up on the determinants on the second line over here. Whereas over here you have Q determinants, so that's the same as the size of this matrix. And the X's that appear in the determinants now appear as a source, okay? There's some sort of, uh, sort of uh, exchange between source and determinants in this equality. Now, let me say a few words for, for the people for whom this is helpful. Uh, and if it's not, don't worry about it. But there's a sort of string theory interpretation of this open, closed, open triality, which is to consider two systems of brains, okay? And essentially integrate one or the other out. So, uh, these n by n matrices are the open strings between n compact brains. So that's why I drew them as circles. Uh, the q by q matrices describe the sort of transverse degrees of freedom of a string between these two non compact brains. And there are some fermions that appear when I rewrite these determinants. So remember that you do a bosonic path integral, you get one over determinants. Fermionic path integrals give you positive powers of the determinants. Okay, so when I rewrite this determinant in terms of fermions, this is essentially introducing these open strings between these n brains and these q brains. So they have a bifundamental index structure, one going from n, the other one going to q. Okay. And what these two theories are is essentially either I integrate out everything out here and I just look at the green stuff, that's the first line. The second line is I integrate out all the green and blue stuff and I get the just the red things. And that's the effective theory on that stack of brains. Okay. So, um, so far, so good. So just going back to the original analogy with, with AUCFT. Yeah. So th these cube brains, they, these would be like the giant graviton? Yes, thing? that's the idea. Um, so there, I mean, you have to make Q quite large. I mean, larger than BMN considered oh, oh. to get into this regime where the two are so, so the, symmetric. Uh, oh, well, this isn't symmetric. So Q, I mean, the Q can be much smaller than N here, for oh, example. Okay. Oh, here, here. Um, 
So I, I, examples of this was done where people look at half BPS determinant operators in n equals four. This is some work by uh, Vescovi, Jiang, and Komatsu. Yes. And you essentially get a, a essentially a, 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 a field theory just on the giant gravitons of Q giant gravitons. That, that's, that's the example. So yeah, the things I'm saying are more general than matrix theories, but I just want to first look at these stupid matrix integrals, yeah. But so you don't need Q to be like comparably large. No, not at all, not at all. So oh, this statement is exact. Uh, this is a exact and N and Q. So I've made no approximations here. Um, these are some of the steps that go in there. We don't really need them, but maybe one thing that will be useful for us later is just to note that once we write the determinants in terms of some fermions, we get this cute, this sort of Yukawa coupling between the matrix and the fermions. Okay, that's sort of one thing to remember for some later slides. So all you need right now is just this equality of matrix integrals. And now what we're gonna do on the second slide is take that semi equality and we're gonna specialize to a particular case where we set this Y variable to zero. Okay, and now let's just look at this first line. So what we wanna do is that I write debt as E to the trace log and I just expand that. Okay, so this just generates some potential here. Okay, these TKs are just some expansion coefficients. Now I'm gonna use the second line and note that this is a two matrix integral. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we first notice that it actually only appears as in the coupling of the product of the two. And there's a change of variables that I can do to split this into the product of two one matrix integrals. That's this line down here, okay? Now, all you need to know is that this matrix integral is something that we understand well, and it's actually what's called the mbimbo wuki matrix model, okay? Written down over here. Now, why is this useful? Okay, so um, what, is, what does this matrix model describe? Okay, so the, the exact coefficients on that aren't really important right now. Um, what does this guy describe? Why is it useful? Now, by taking derivatives with respect to tk or t bar k, I can compute correlation functions in this particular C equals one 2D string theory of certain tachyon operators, okay? That's these TKs, okay? That's why this matrix integral is gonna be useful for us. Now, why is this equality useful for us between the top line and the bottom line? It's because I can take the derivative with respect to TK up here, and what does that do? So if I take a derivative with respect to T bar K, that brings down a factor of trace M to the K, okay? And I can, because these things are equal, I can do the same thing down here. And that just inserts a negative momentum tachyon, okay? And because all of this is exact, this is just an exact operator dictionary between trace M to the K and these tachyon operators in the C equals one theory, okay? So that's why this is useful. So let me now try to go back to our, uh, sorry, maybe one last thing I'll say here is, uh, you might think, well, maybe this is a little crazy. Um, so as a good sanity check, one thing you can do is to check this proposal in a particular case where you can compute it. Um, so actually this was a calculation rejected in 1997 and they had no idea why this was true. They just sort of first started doing it at low genus and noticed that these two things were equal. Um, so it's saying, I'm gonna look at the Gaussian matrix model and that corresponds to having a, turning on a momentum plus two tachyon in the sequels one background. Um, and you can then compute this one point function of these tachyon operators on the matrix side, uh, sorry, on the string side. And it turns out that this is a computation you can do to all genus. And then you can do the same thing on the Gaussian. And indeed you find that they agree. This is the TurboTax check mark. Okay, so uh, we all have a little PTSD from testing. Okay, so if you know, this isn't important, but if you want, this is sort of one way of writing that correlator to all orders in one over n. So again, if you lost the big picture, how does this actually verify the proposal? Let's go back. Is that what we did is that we, we started from this Gaussian matrix model and we understood, we extracted via this matrix equality, this operator dictionary between trace M to the K and these tachyons, okay? And now we're just gonna basically piggyback off the work of uh, all of these people here where they understood also how to basically rewrite the operators in this equals one string on this B model side and on this A model side, okay? So once you have that, you now have this map between trace M to the K and the Vs and the trace M to the K and these curly Ts, okay? So that's, that's what establishes this. And because everything was exact in one over N, this is true to all genus, okay? So this is an all genus for all endpoint functions, quality of quarters that we now know is just true. 
So um, this is maybe for the slightly more mathematical crowd, but I'll, for people who at least know some of this topic, I think uh, it's worth mentioning. Um, it's to put in perspective, what are the manipulations we did and sort of as a proof strategy. It was like step back for a second, think what was kind of the role of this in Bimbo Mukti matrix model. So when people studied double scaled matrix integrals, okay, for example, uh, uh, when people were looking at the double scaled uh, Gaussian and they came up with this, in particular this Witten conjecture saying that the correlators in that theory were some observables in 2D topological gravity. Uh, Konzevich proved that conjecture using a totally different type of matrix model, which was not double scaled. Okay, and so for a long time, people had no idea about the relationship between the two. Um, and it was the work of, I think, Cyberg, Maldacena, Moore, and she, um, that first basically did the type of manipulations we did uh, for the Gaussian case. And then they looked at the double scaling limit and they showed that the double scaled Gaussian ended up being the cubic uh, Konzevich model. So that's this case for P equals to two. So what we can try to basically show here is that we can do this generally for this arbitrary potential VP that was hanging around, okay. So we get what we call uh, this other open string description, which is this Mbimbo Muki matrix model. And what you can show is that instead of double scaling, so we take sort of n to infinity here strictly, we can sort of translate that limit on this bottom side of the slide, okay? But Q is fixed. So that's why we're not gonna get a double scaled matrix model on the bottom, okay? So we keep Q fixed, but n double scaling. And what you find is that this Mbibo Muki matrix model ends up being the generalized Konzevich model for this particular scaling. Okay. So uh, one last thing I'll say is that um, this matrix model, at least for the case of people's two, was shown to be exactly some open string field theory of uh, Leoville plus C equals minus two on Q FCZT brains. So this is some really beautiful work by Gaiotto and Rastelli. So one thing we'd hope is to understand in what sense this is also some open string field theory. And generally, the, the thing I haven't told you yet, why are these V types and F types hanging around on all the slides, is that F type, the, the way that you sort of um, close strings emerge from this theory or that theory are a little different. Um, but the big picture is that they get sort of, uh, they get related by this idea of open closed open triality. <clears throat> Okay, so those were a little technical. Let me draw some pretty pictures uh, to try to say what are the kind of the bigger uh, picture ideas that we're getting from. So um, basically, I want to argue that this open close open triality is actually teaching us something about the way that closed strings emerge from Feynman diagrams, and that there's in fact two ways that can happen. Okay, so. Um, Let's look at this, okay? So this is some closed genus two uh, Riemann surface. Okay, this is the world sheet of some string, closed string theory. And these little infinities you see are marked points. That's where the vertex operators would be put, okay? There's a, a way um, to basically sort of splice up this world sheet into particular patches, okay? And the boundaries of each patch are these sort of dark lines. Um, for those who know, these are the critical horizontal trajectories of the Strabel differential. Um, and the point now is that uh, basically what you've done is sort of in each patch, you have some local coordinate chart, right? How is the manifold? You just have local coordinate charts and you need to tell me how you glue them together. And what the Strabel differential does is that it essentially translates the complex structure of this Riemann surface into combinatorial data of some graph, okay? And you can reconstruct uh, F, you can reconstruct this exactly just by knowing these dark lines here. Okay, so that's a really beautiful. That's why it's such a powerful tool. Sorry, can I just to please. Yeah, the complex structure is a continuous variable, but the the combinatoric. So the plus plus the lengths plus the lengths. Plus the lengths. So th those end up being the the continuous variables that you need. And there's a sort of simple dimension counting argument. I could tell you uh, why sort of the number of lengths here is the same as the dimension of the moduli space. I see. So I, see. But I, I just didn't want to get into details. Uh, okay, so let me tell you now. So uh, um, is there some sort of dual triangulation business happening? In yes, the DNA? yes, just exactly. Like one duality on exactly. So, so we're, we're, this is the, the kind of big takeaway 
is that there's actually going to be two ways in which sort of holography can work. And it's going to be the two ways in which you can reconstruct this closed world sheet from open string things, from ribbon graphs. So in one of them, uh, all the vertices, okay, so all the wherever vertex operators are inserted, correspond to faces of the Feynman diagram. And the ribbons of the graph line up with these dark lines, okay? The way that this works is basically this is some, some type of D-brain, and it shrinks to zero size, and you replace that D-brain boundary state by a sum of local operators. And in fact, this is the exact picture you can follow in the work of Gaiotto and Rastelli um, for that comes out of model. V-type duality is more like what we have in N equals four, okay? So for example, if I looked at some four-point function of single trace operators, on the world sheet, that's a, again a four-point function. So there are as, number, as many number of vertices in the Feynman diagram as there are uh, vertex operators, okay? So here it's the fact that the vertices of the diagram Go on to vertice, uh, go on to the marked points. Okay, so here was every face had one marked point. Here it's every vertex has one marked point. Okay, so this exchange between vertices and faces is just some sort of graph duality. Okay, so now let's go up to this top one and reinterpret some of the some of the uh, steps that we did in our matrix equality. You don't need to remember the exact steps. But the idea was that when we wrote determinants in terms of fermions, we had this type of Yukawa coupling. Okay, so dotted these mixed lines are the fermions, these are the matrices. When we integrate out to the n by n matrices, we get a theory just with these fermions. And then we again integrate in some q by q matrices. And that essentially, uh, if you want, it kind of resolves this four point vertex in a different way. And what you see here is that every edge of the original Feynman diagram becomes the dual edge. So this is a statement at the level of every single world sheet and every single Feynman diagram. It's a sort of hyper fine type of, uh, of, of relation between the two. Um, so maybe I'll skip this a little. Um, now the, the idea about the triality I'll just say is, so this is you know, nothing we've proven, but we think is true. Um, so there are basically these two types of ways that open closed sort of holography can work. Okay, um, so again, this vertex type where sort of the vertices of the Feynman diagram end up being the uh, marked points of the world sheet, or there's sort of a face type open closed duality. Um, this is, for example, in uh, this is SUN Sharon Simons and the A model on the resolved conifold, for example, where basically the, it's <laughs> like what I showed you on the first slide that the faces end up uh, going to each marked point. But the idea is that there's actually both of these descriptions that exist. Okay. The same way that there are these two equal matrix integrals, those are the two open stream descriptions. So there's actually really two open stream descriptions for the same closed geometry. So that's the bigger statement that there's not only just two different types of dualities, but in fact, this general triality. Okay. Um, good. Uh, so in the last, let's say 20 minutes, um, I have about three slides for the A model and three slides for the B model. And what I want to do is to try to sort of explain, you know, why these are the type of closed strings that you should land on from the structure of the correlators of the matrix theory. Okay, so let's start with the A model. So for people who don't know the A model, well, I mean, I certainly didn't. Uh, the A model is a, so the a string theory is always maps from the world sheet to some target space. And you can think about each string theory as sort of what are the type of maps that you're considering. So the A model string is looking at very particular types of maps that are holomorphic maps. Holomorphic maps from the world sheet to the target space. And we wanna see how are those hiding in the matrix. Okay. So that's gonna be the point of these next three slides. So these words about V type and F type you might think are sort of uh, you know mumbo jumbo. Um, and I want to use this very particular example to show you that we're going to use that type of mentality to make very concrete predictions for what the correlators are. And this is something that you can then quantitatively check. Okay. So we're going to look at a particular correlator. So these are, there are three vertices. So this is a three point function. Okay. Expectation value of trace m to the eight, trace m to the eight, trace m to the eight. These double dots is just some technical thing. It just means you don't look at any self contractions. So whatever. So what we want to do is we want to now go from this Feynman diagram to the world sheet and a point on the moduli space and show you how this works very concretely. So what does it mean to do that? We want to go from open strings which have holes to closed strings that don't have holes. Okay, so we want to 
successively closed up the holes if you want. So let's do that. What are the holes that we're going to close up? It's any index loop where you have the same color flowing. Okay. So we're going to first basically uh, close up all these holes here that are between the ribbons. Okay. And so when I bunch up all of these guys, it's going to give me some semi infinite strip, which is this one over here. Okay. I, and the width of the strip is just the number of width contractions. Okay. You should think of each ribbon as giving you sort of one width. So I just bunch these all up together and I get that strip over here. Uh, and I'm going to do the same thing for the blue guy that's over here. And I'm going to do the same thing for the green guy and that's guy over here. And we have two holes left to close up, which are labeled by these indices flowing around, these uh, summed over i and summed over j. Okay, so that's sort of here, this i in the front. And then there's the j in the back. Okay, and now I'm going to basically glue these three guys together. Okay. And that gives me the sort of standard pair of pants, three punctured sphere on the, on the string. And what I'm going to do now is I want to think about this yellow stuff. So what is the yellow stuff? It's just the dual graph. Okay. So right, I draw a line sort of uh, perpendicular to these, perpendicular, perpendicular. That's the yellow. And the number is four is just the number of width contractions. Okay. These are the same Strabo graphs that we talked about on the very first slide, where the lengths here are integers. So why are they integers? Because it's just always the number of width contractions between two vertices. And now you can remember that the lengths of these guys are essentially coordinates on this moduli space. So what is that? It means that this Feynman diagram, I just look at the point on moduli space that's labeled by 444. Four, four. Okay, so um, this is M03, so it's a little, uh, it's just a point, but yeah, this is the simplest example. So now we can think, okay, so when I look at some correlator in the Gaussian, what do I do? I just sum over all the width contractions. I sum over all the Feynman diagrams. Each Feynman diagram, as we just showed, is a point on the moduli space, okay? So the sum over the Feynman diagrams is a sum over integer length stribble graphs. That's the sum of the yellow things. And each of these graphs is a point on the moduli space, okay? So what this correlator is doing is it's, it's just summing, it's just counting the number of these points. And this actually is something that mathematicians study under the word of discrete volumes, okay? And so you can open up your favorite paper on the subject. There's often tables that tell you what those numbers are, okay? And indeed you can check. So you can go back and you can compute on the Gaussian matrix model some correlator. For example, here, this is the endpoint function of even traces of genus zero. Uh, this is something that Rajesh did with his student, Roji. Uh, this is something that we just did here with the uh, genus one. And this gives you a prediction and indeed they match, okay? So, you know, it's a sanity check in the sense of that, you know, if what I told you here is true, uh, it had to be true. So there's nothing new, but it's a good check of uh, making sure that what you're saying is correct. Um, okay, so uh, this slide, so far I've said nothing about maps. I've just talked about counting points on moduli space. Um, so I wanna, the details again aren't too, too important, okay? Um, but it's just, I, there's a particularly nice way of rewriting the sum over Feynman diagrams as a sum over particular types of permutations. Okay. If you want, uh, each Feynman, so each weak contraction can be labeled by this. So how many M's do I have? I have uh, two to the sum of the Ki. That's what this K is without an index. Um, so whenever I contract two M's in the correlator, that's one weak contraction. Okay. And so I, I do two to the K. This is just some cycle notation for these, uh, these uh, permutations. Okay, this is another way of describing these permutations and same for this third one over here. And the point I'd like to say is that each of these permutations from the physics perspective has a very geometrical interpretation as the edges of the Feynman diagram, the vertices of the Feynman diagram and the faces of the Feynman diagram. Okay. Now, the how holomorphic maps come in is that uh, permutations can also be basically, uh, it's sort of equal data to holomorphic coverings of the sphere branched over particular points and branched over as many points as there are permutations. Okay, so we're gonna look at particular holomorphic coverings of the sphere branched over three points because there's this alpha, beta, and gamma. And they have a particular branching structure. That's what type of permutations alpha, beta, and gamma are. That's what I'm drawing here on the left-hand side schematically. 
So they're branched, say, over zero, one, and infinity of the Riemann sphere. And these are very particular types of maps called belly maps in the mathematics literature. Now, the beautiful thing is that belly maps, you can't take any world sheet and cover the sphere in that way, okay? Only very particular world sheets admit such maps. What are the world sheets that admit such maps? Well, they turn out to be exactly the ones described by these discrete points, okay? So here we have very directly written the combinatorics of some correlator in terms of maps, and those maps are exactly the points on the moduli space that we just saw from the Struble construction, okay? So the beautiful thing now is that this connects with the work of Andrea, Lawrence, uh, um, I guess uh, yeah, well, people before as well on sort of this localization scene in this theory here, where it was shown that the only maps that are contributing to this path integral are exactly, are exactly branched covers of the sphere. Okay? So the remaining thing to do that we're trying to work out is to show that they branch over exactly three points in that particular way. So for us, then that would sort of completely establish the aim of the five. Let me say one thing about the BMN limit. Um, so again, what we're going to do is we're going to look at this correlator and we're going to take a limit of very large K. Okay. So let's think, first of all, so uh, maybe many of you have seen the eigenvalue distribution uh, for a Gaussian uh, matrix model. Okay. That means take some matrix sampled from this distribution, look at its eigenvalues, make a histogram, it's gonna look like this circle, okay? And we can ask uh, the expectation value of this, so what are the eigenvalues that are gonna to contribute to this at very large K? Well, it's gonna, so trace is just the sum of the eigenvalues to the K, right, to the two K. So it's gonna be the largest eigenvalues that are gonna contribute here, right? So the lar this is gonna sample the largest eigenvalues. So what is that going to do? It's going to sample basically this region here and here of the Wigner semicircle. This is exactly what you do in a double scaling limit where you zoom into this region. And we actually understand what are the correlators that you get there. They're given in terms of these 2D topological gravity things. And in fact, you can see this very clearly. So the limit of sort of counting these lattice points end up giving you particular sort of continuous volumes of moduli space. So if you want this BMN limit, what it's doing is that it's washing away the discreteness of these integer points. You're having more and more points because you have more and more ways of weight contracting the various vertices together, okay? And you essentially cover the moduli space continuously. And sort of the count of this points goes on to a volume, which is our, it's an integral of this particular volume form if you're interested. Um, so, uh, I'll say a couple words on the B model and I'll keep it short. Uh, so let me maybe first just make the, the statement, uh, which is, yeah, so I, yeah, maybe I'll stick mostly to the slide. Okay, so what we can do using topological recursion, this is mostly due to some work by Einard uh, in 2011, is to, is to establish this equality over here. Okay, so the way you should think about it is that we're again translating about this integral over matrices into an integral over a moduli space. With this moduli space in topological recursion, it's called a colored moduli space. What it really is is actually the moduli space of constant maps to two points. And we're going to see where that comes in. Okay. And if you tell me this V of M, that's going to be uh, some part of the integrand on moduli space that's true, that's the same for all correlators. Okay. So this lambda thing is always sticking around. And what it is, it's essentially the moduli space integrand way of encoding what is the geometry that the string sees. Uh, it essentially arises from integrating out matter on the string side. And then we have this dictionary between the various traces, m to the k, and these particular cohomology classes, or whatever you want to say to, to put here. Okay. And again, the large n expansion of this correlator ends up being the same as the genus expansion here, as you can see very clearly. So one of the things we did is to basically compute these moduli space integrals and check that they're indeed agree with correlators that you can compute in the Gaussian matrix model. So they're like slightly technical algebraic geometry computations, but they indeed agree as they have to. Okay, so these are just some sanity checks. Um, think about, so in the interest of time, uh, yeah, maybe I'll just uh, 
very quickly flash on the slide is that the things that I'm sort of hiding under the rug, these are very, very explicit things. Okay, um, so this is, for example, writing trace m to the k in terms of uh, certain psi classes, and we, you know, all of these coefficients we've determined, and so you know, this is very explicit. That's why you can sit down and just do this computation and check that they agree. So um, that's just to try to tell you the level of detail that's uh, showing up. Um, okay. Um, on this slide, maybe the one thing to take away is that it's actually a pretty powerful result. Uh, so one of the things that we looked at was this BMN limit here. And it turns out that what that does is it sort of washes away this, uh, this background, if you want. Um, again, it's just saying sort of whatever the kind of part of the Wigner semicircle in the middle doesn't really matter. All you care about are just the edges. And that's sort of the, what this is saying here. Um, but this top line, again, you don't need to understand the details. This was a result by Akunkov and then later by Akunkov and Pandare Pandey uh, in the math literature that established uh, the large and sort of this BMN limit of correlators in terms of these intersection numbers here. So integrals over moduli space again. Um, this partly won him the Fields Medal. And this, uh, this is a very complicated proof. It's like asymptotics of Hurwitz coverings and things like that. And it's sort of like a two line derivation now out of this. So that's that was very nice. Just on the nose, all the coefficients and everything worked out. So that was really satisfying. Okay, I'll finish on this last slide, uh, which is just to try to embed some of these ideas in the broader context of ADS CFT. You might say, well, okay, Gaussian matrix model, uh, good story, buddy. What are you going to really do with that? Um, but, you know, I think there is some hope that I think the things that we're learning here. Um, do generalize, and in particular, because we're not trying to think so much about just the bulk geometry. So, you know, you start from some zero plus zero dimensional theory, you might think that the bulk is like zero plus one or something. I, those are just words. But because you're really trying to think about reconstructing the world sheet, and that's a sort of more general feature. Um, and so let me embed this a little in ADS-CFT. It turns out that there is a way of doing that. So if you start from sort of our ultimate goal here of understanding n equals four super young mills, um, there's a particular subsector called the 2D chiral subalgebra. And there's a lot of work been going on here called in this twisted holography program. So um, where people basically try to think about, so this is a closed subsector of operators, okay? And there is a set, essentially a sort of closed topological string sector as well that is dual, okay? Um, so this is the work by these people here. And there's actually a sort of further, again, closed subsector of this 2D parallel algebra and whose correlation functions are captured, are basically just moments in the Gaussian matrix model. And sort of, we've kind of understood this now. So in particular, there's an A model description here that's missing over here. And that's one of the things we're talking about with uh, Kevin and David. Um, there's also some ideas about how to maybe take this B model here and get the B model that we have. So that's some work in progress we're doing. But you know, there, there's some sort of inclusion that we hope to, to try to understand a little better. So that's the sort of ultimate, very, very long-term uh, dream. Um, but yeah, I'll leave it with that. And uh, I know that was a lot of material in one thing. So uh, we'll maybe stop a little early. But I'm happy to answer some questions, go over some things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there some like algebraic structure that is underlying all the three, like the matrix model under two different string theories? Um, what, what do you mean like algebraic structure? Like, if, <clears throat> like maybe like the 2D CFT correlation functions are described by like some underlying ribbon graph like thing or some rules of directly associate, computing something associated to like a picture. Maybe the best thing I can say is that um, the partition function with sources, they usually obey some differential equation. Um, and these are certain integrability constraints. So this was understood well in the, in the double scale matrix models extremely well. Um, that for example, you'll have a Virasaurus symmetry or something like that appear. And that's the same Virasaurus symmetry as on the, on the, the, the string side. Um, so there, there was a you know, this type of WN and W infinity relations that are sort of satisfied by partition functions with sources that are also satisfied from the string side. I think that's maybe the closest I could answer that with. Um, 
and is there a way to understand what happens as you do some monotromy of the of the sources on the like vertices on the modular space like what is the matrix model interpretation of i don't know about vertices on the modular space like I mean, it just punctures on the on the surface yeah itself. yeah not that i at least not that i can say right away for example the fact that these three permutations uh sort of are the product of those three permutations is equal to one is a monodromy statement around branch coverings on the sphere yeah uh, so that that is for example i don't know it's close yes can we go back to the previous the previous uh, slide yeah of course so he he you have this nice picture n equal four 2d final sub algebra now see a matrix model yeah I, could i at least for the first two boxes, could I have done two zero theory, two D chiral sub algebra, something? Um, all right, short answer is I have no idea because uh, I don't know very much about these two comma zero theories. Um, and uh, I, my, my guess would be yes, but truly I would give very little weight to that statement. Um, yeah, I, I just don't know anything about these six theories. And, and um, if I start with the bottom right box, the B model, if I replace SL2 with SLK, is there a guess for what is above it? Like for a high spin gravity theory rather than. Oh, SLK. Uh, yeah, so keep keep, keep the level special state at one, but change to the K. I know what you mean with the high spin gravity. You're thinking about some like gauge theory formulation of 2D gravity in terms of some like BF theory yeah. and the gauge theory is like SLKR or something. Yeah. But I, I think the role of this SL2R mod U1 is very different. It's about, it's the targets. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's the cigar geometry. Mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't think it's, uh, yeah, I think the role of the two here is a little different than the one. So the two is special. Like, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. You, you couldn't imagine a, a different coset, G1H, one h coset, level one. I mean, honestly, I haven't thought about it. Um, yeah. Maybe there's a relation between this SL2R and something about SL2R gauge theory formulations of gravity, but mm. at least not that I've thought about. They seem a little different. Still has to have C equals nine. Then. Yeah, exactly. So probably wouldn't. Uh, yeah, actually, that's the answer, right? Yeah. Um, th this, this. This has exactly a very special central charges to C equals nine, as David was saying. And if you change the gauge group, that would change C. So I think it would only have tune the K so that it's Yeah, but then you'd have to change K as well. K okay, would be weird. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Sure. But if you kept K equals one, yeah. So then it would not work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that's the answer, I think. Yeah. So if you were going to have a third row for the other open stream theory. How would you fill in those three boxes? Good. Okay. Um, so that's wild speculation. I'm happy to say some things. That's why I didn't include it on the slide. Um, yeah, so for this Gaussian matrix model, it's basically this in Bibomuki. I don't know what to say here. Here, there's some ideas that like the F type description. So as I said, I think some of the most concrete work I've seen has been when people insert giant gravitons, which are these determinant operators. So it's very similar. And then at at you know they're, they're they're protected and I can look at free n equals four and then I integrate out the the, the n equals four and by n matrices and I get this q by q matrix description. Um, that's maybe the most concrete thing I can say. The more speculative thing is actually that it might be in terms of this um, twister string description. So uh, one of the reasons again I don't know much about twister string theory so I'm uh, scared to venture in those lands a little, but uh, uh, the reason being is that one of the things that we think about these F-type dualities is that they're sort of more prone to describe sort of weakly coupled gauge theories. Um, and as you know from the work of Witten, the sort of weakly, the sort of string theory description of weakly coupled Yang Mills has a sort of natural B model topological string in twister space. How natural it is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So how natural that is uh, is another thing. But you know, for example, one of the things is like operators that are local and say single trace and v-type duality are very weird on f-type duality. So like 
traces of the matrix in the Konzevich model don't really have any real geometric meaning. And recently people tried computing like um, stress energy co uh, tensor correlators in this twister string description. And the expressions we get are sort of super nasty and non-local and, and we basically, and it's in particular not single trace. So, so you know, this has the right smell that it's sort of uh, kind of an F type, but I mean, these are just words. Why we then send up Nathan's twister string? <laughs> I'm sorry to have offended you having worked with Nathan. <laughs> Um, I, I probably don't know the distinction enough between the two. Um, well, in Widens, it's like the instant does in Nathan is just like a straight to level of computation. So it's more like, it's not so weird. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's more natural than Widens propose. Yeah. And the other motivation for that statement is some of the more recent work of Rajesh and Matthias on this twister string description of free and equals floor. So maybe there's something to connect to there. But I should say that, you know, some of this duality, there are actually things that are easier to compute on the moduli space side than on the matrix side. So that's actually a little surprising. Um, so we actually derived some new results for the Gaussian matrix model by doing intersection theory, which is kind of surprising. Uh, yeah, those are more technical things, but let me just. Yeah. Well, if there are no more questions, let's thank Edward again. Yeah.